Hello and welcome to our Dividend Cafe video this week. We're recording kind of middle of the day on Thursday, so market's not quite closed. We're up 170 points as I look at my screen today alone. We've been up a few hundred already this week. And maybe you're thinking, that's kind of odd. Why would the market be up uh, again quite substantially into, you know, you're talking about now over 6, 6.5% year to date. And we opened up this week with the entire United States government shut down. And then now it's kind of sort of reopened, but it faces another little drama on February 8th, I believe, if they haven't kind of worked out another arrangement. So here's sort of the best thing I can say. If the idea of the government shutting down um, and the market's completely shrugging it off, and I would argue the vast majority of the country is shrugging it off, is not an example of the disconnect that exists right now between markets and I would argue probably the whole country and Washington DC then I don't know what is I don't think it should be surprising I think it's exactly what we would have expected and it fits into the narrative that's been going on for well over a year now of uh, markets having a focus on the things that matter to markets and the press having a focus on things that matter to the Beltway. And that disconnect is potentially losing people money if they are making investment decisions around the, their expectation that these two things are going to be coming together, that markets and the priorities of Washington, D.C. Um, are going to be aligning. Uh, I would expect this theme to continue well into 2018, that earnings are going to drive markets. And so I think it's important, and not just earnings drive markets, but markets having like a pretty much unwavering apathy about all the noise and nonsense out of our nation's capital. So that may frustrate some people. I don't know why it would. It may surprise people. That's fair enough. But um, it, it in no way confounds uh, the basic principles of investing and what we believe to be logical, economically coherent uh, causes and effects in investment risk assets. What does disrupt the party? I mean, it's one thing to say, by the way, well, markets are, are growing because earnings are growing. And so as long as earnings keep growing, markets will keep growing. Because really, I guess what people would want to know is, well, when will earnings growth slow? What will be the catalyst to earnings growth slowing? What do we want to look out for in that in that sense. That's those are fair questions. There is always the possibility that earnings growth continues to move, but the multiple on on what the market pays for those earnings might shrink. But then you have to wonder what would be that catalyst? What would be a catalyst to earnings growth uh, getting a lower valuation placed on it? And these are where you might start to think I'm talking too high level investment speak, but I think these are basic principles and ones we want our clients to really understand. Um, yes, we do believe that earnings growth will continue and we believe it will continue as long as global growth continues. So to the degree that this ongoing positive GDP acceleration continues, we don't see any reason why earnings growth in the marketplace would slow down. As far as the valuation issue goes, this gets to the heart of monetary policy. Risk assets are priced around a discount rate or or what we call a risk-free rate, if you will. To the degree that liquidity is taken out of the system um, and that that risk uh, rate is moved higher, the reference rate, um, then you could have a repricing of risk assets. And that could be the beginning of the end of this secular bull market. When does that begin? I don't know. I think it could be quite some time. Um, I wouldn't dare to time it. I don't recommend anyone else time it. But I expect that to be sort of the pattern, that earnings growth continues, global growth continues, and at some point you get a repricing of that around monetary tightening, that monetary tightening not being there now. So we're kind of biting off a lot here this week conceptually, but I hope you under, understand what it is I'm saying. Happy for you to email me any questions and so forth. Um, where are we on the inflation talk? Well, it, you know, we're a grand total three weeks into the new year. And there's no new data or anything like that that I would suggest is driving this conversation. But early into the year, I do want to say that we already are encountering more conversations about inflation. Um, 
I do believe we're already seeing a lot of our theme regarding technology companies from becoming somewhat non grata in, in various socio-political conversations. There's a lot of negative press. Um, I think that from a small cap standpoint, I'll look at my screen here as we're talking. Um, has that theme started to play out? Small caps over 6% as well. Big caps up about 6%. So you don't necessarily, they're performing together, not necessarily one over the other. But yeah, I, I believe that we made some positioning decisions for the year that we think are three months, six months, maybe 12 month outlooks. And, and some of them are already kind of playing in quickly. So it'll be interesting to see if revision becomes necessary sooner than later. But all that to say, when you get back to the uh, inflation talk, which is another theme of ours, um, look, it's a game changer. Should there begin to be actual inflation that requires central bank responsiveness, that accelerates the repricing of risk assets. The question is whether or not uh, you're going to get the healthy kind of growth that moves interest rates higher, or you're going to get inflationary growth that requires a monetary response. Uh, productive growth is the most bullish thing for markets. Inflationary growth or deflationary non-growth are the worst things. Those are two different, think of it like a hurricane and an earthquake. They're both really bad. They're just different. These are generally the two negatives to markets. And you want to have some degree of defensiveness in your portfolio around any type of scenario. Uh, fundamentally, as advocates of a free enterprise economy, we believe that self-interest and companies allocating capital efficiently works. And that you derive a risk premium out of investing in that process. And the better companies and managers and things you're working with, the better the result will be. But we believe in the process of private enterprise and the monetization of private enterprise as an equity investor. But we also understand that on a macro level, some of the risks that can come into fray, we have seen the effect of deflation in Japan over a 25-year period. We saw the um, transitory deflationary effect of our financial crisis in 2008. And then you have um, a different headwind of markets that we have not seen in a long time that is inflation eroding the value of future earnings, therefore compressing the valuation we can put on those future earnings in the present. Inflation is no good. How do you defend against it as an investor? We believe that dividend growth stocks from companies that have pricing power give us a leg up on both fronts because they can grow the dividend even as inflation is moving higher and the actual economic effect of the inflation in society is most defended against by companies that can raise prices, hence pricing power. Uh, bond investors can't say that and a lot of companies can't say that. Companies that have very weak competitive position or very low profit margins are not often in a position to do it. So that's our general philosophical framework around it. We love talking about it. Do you start looking at commodities into a potentially inflationary environment? Sure. We don't want to go take a big systemic position in something like gold where we don't get any rate of return. We need people to buy our gold at a higher price. That's not what we mean by an internal rate of return. We want earnings. We want cash flow. So then you have maybe commodity-oriented companies that are operating companies that build a profit stream. We're looking where there may be opportunities to incorporate some of that in the portfolio. But part of the problem with commodity-sensitive companies is you buy the commodity beta for good or for bad. And it makes us a little more dependent on commodity price in our performance than we want to be. So we're careful about it. I, I, I hope that all makes sense. Uh, I think it did. I'll, I'll, I'll give myself a passing grade for that explanation. I'm going to leave it there for the week. Um, reach out with any questions. We're going to recap for you next week how January played out. Obviously, great start to the new year. And we keep doing what we're doing. We're working away. Reach out if you need us.